Now, before I get into today's passage, um, I want to talk to you about jigsaw puzzles. Now, my, my youngest son, Nathaniel, absolutely loves jigsaw puzzles. You give him a jigsaw puzzle and it can keep him occupied for, well, at least five minutes. Uh, no, probably more like 45 minutes or an hour even, which is, look, <laughs> believe me, that's pretty good for our boys. But when those jigsaw puzzle pieces are all jumbled up, you can see the individual pieces, but you can't see the whole picture. And that's a little bit like what the Bible is like. The Bible is a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Some parts on their own don't seem to make sense to us, and they can be confusing. It's only when we put them together, put all those pieces together, that we can understand the big picture. And that's a little bit how, uh, a little bit like how uh, Jesus' followers must have felt the, the days after his death. Nothing made sense. They'd seen things happen that they just, they, they just couldn't put together. They couldn't understand how, how this could be the man they thought he was. It took Jesus to come to them, to walk alongside them, and to slowly put those pieces together for them. He had to first show them that the Bible is one coherent story pointing towards him, pointing us towards his death and resurrection. To see who Jesus is and what his death and resurrection meant, they first had to see how those events fitted into the bigger picture. And that's what Jesus does in Luke chapter 24. But first of all, before we begin digging into the passage, I want to remind us of where we are in the Bible. So we've been going through uh, the book of Luke for a long time now, um, and we're coming towards the end now. Now, Luke, as you probably know, is is one of four accounts in the Bible about Jesus' life. We call them the Gospels. Um, And each has a different perspective on the same historical events. Each has a different author and each has a unique purpose. Now, Luke is written by a guy called Luke. Uh, Surprise, surprise. But it's written to uh, a Gentile audience. That means a non-Jew audience. And one of the things that Luke is trying to convince his readers of is that Christianity is not a new religion. It's not some kind of sect or offshoot of Judaism. No, instead, Christianity is the fulfillment of the religion of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It's the the fulfillment of Judaism. And the key theme of Luke I think can be summed up in chapter 19, where Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And as we come towards the end of Luke now, we've only got um, a few more uh, passages in Luke to, to look at. We see the way in which Jesus did that saving. And what a plot twist. What a shock. The way he does it, the way he seeks and saves sinners, seeks and saves the lost, would have been shocking to his original readers. And that's the point of the passage today. What we see at the end of Luke is just how much it cost God to save sinners like you and me. We see how the whole of the scriptures, the whole of the Old Testament up until that point was pointing us towards this man and this moment. So I've um, split the passage up today. Uh, We're looking at uh, Luke chapter 24 verses 13 through to verse 35. And I've split it in two halves really. So the first half is verses 13 to 24. We're going to look at that first. And I've titled it, The Troubled Travellers and the Mysterious Stranger. The Troubled Travellers and the Mysterious Stranger. Now Luke, at this point, like a Hollywood film director, sets the scene in, in verses 13 to 16, and then he zooms in. So three days have passed since Jesus' execution. 
And then what Luke does is he zooms in to two people walking along a road slowly with their heads hanging low. They're walking from Jerusalem back to the place where they live, a place called Emmaus, which is an obscure village in the surrounding area, somewhere around Jerusalem. And one of these people is called Cleopas. Uh, The other we're not told. Um, It could be a man, it could be a woman. It could even be Cleopas' wife. But these two people are having a heated discussion. Um, Take a look at... um, verse 15 while they were talking and discussing together what that word there means or implies is debating arguing disputing questioning they are having an emotional debate here and they're talking about the events that have just happened over the last few days trying to make sense of what has happened verse 17 gives us an insight into their mental state into their emotional state It says this, it says, when this stranger comes up to them and asks them what they're talking about, they stood still, looking sad. Now, looking sad, what it actually means there, literally, is their faces were downcast, their faces were just hanging low. They were despairing. Jesus of Nazareth, the one person that he had had such high hopes for, now lay dead and buried. They describe him in verse 19 as a prophet, mighty in word and deed. They had hoped even, they had even hoped that he might be the one to redeem Israel. Uh, See verse 21. They had dared to hope that Jesus was the promised saviour, that God's people had been promised long ago Uh, by the prophets but they had just watched him die they just watched him die a cruel and humiliating death executed by the Romans they had hoped that he might be that promised saviour that he might be the messiah but their hopes had been dashed as he hung weak and naked on that cross his body had been taken down limp and lifeless and put into a cold, dark tomb. There's no going back from this. He, he can't be the person they thought he was. They are utterly crushed and despairing. Now, unlike modern Christians, these two probably didn't have a category in their minds for a Messiah who would die in such a humbling and humiliating way. And as Gordon mentioned last week, Nobody was expecting a resurrection here. The women went to the tomb and they were carrying spices. Why were they carrying spices? Well, they were carrying spices because they were expecting a body, a dead body. They were expecting to prepare his body for for burial. All they could see at this stage was failure and despair. All their hopes are lost. But not just that, they're confused and they're doubting as well. Take a look at verse 22 uh, to 24. They talk about these women who had come to them that morning, claiming that they had gone to the tomb and they'd found it empty. And not just that, these women had claimed that they'd seen angelic beings, angels, spiritual beings, who'd spoken to them and told them that Jesus was alive. Pretty bold claims. And they're clearly not convinced. I mean, for one, their return home and their sad face is a testament to this, aren't they? And in their own words, verse 21, it's been three days. Three days. This guy's dead. So they're amazed, but they're not convinced by the women's story. And while all these thoughts are are whirling around their confused minds... A mysterious stranger draws near. And at this point, Luke lets us into a secret, doesn't he? He tells us that this stranger is in fact Jesus, alive. But Cleopas and his friend don't know this. They don't recognise him at that point. In fact, we're told in in verse 16 that their eyes were kept from recognising him. God 
wouldn't allow them to recognise Jesus. And this raises a question, doesn't it? Why? Wouldn't it be easier for Jesus just to show up, show them the goods, holds my hands, you know, hey, I'm alive, hi guys, skip all the small talk? No, it would be easier, but Jesus wants to teach them something. Jesus wants to ground their confidence that he's alive in something even deeper than what their eyes can see. He wants them to see the bigger picture first. I mean, isn't this true of our own experience as well? I mean, if you're anything like me, I want to rush to the good bit. I want to rush to the good bit where I have that experience or I have that understanding. I just want to get there fast. I don't want to, all, all, the, all the faff along the way. But God wants to teach us something along the way. He wants to ground us in something more dependable than mere experience alone. What was true for those two doubting, confused travellers who'd all but given up on Jesus is also true for us today. We might want quick answers, easy answers. We want, might want ex exciting experiences. But God sometimes takes us the slow way. He takes us the slow way to teach us something. He wants us to see clearly who Jesus of Nazareth is, to know beyond any doubt that Jesus was the Son of God who suffered and died and was raised again from death so that we can be free. God wants to ground our confidence, just like he grounded these two um, travellers' confidence. He wants to ground our confidence that Jesus is alive in something deeper than just what we can see. So that begs the question, how does Jesus reveal himself to these two travellers? Well, that takes us to the second half of this passage, verse 25 um, through to verse 35. Jesus takes them on the scenic route, doesn't he? He takes them on the long route, as we've already said. In verse 27, Jesus, before he can show himself to them, he must walk them back through the centuries. Jesus shows them that the story of God's people up until that moment, recorded in the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, recorded in the Psalms, recorded in the, in the prophets, all of the Old Testament is pointing towards him and is fulfilled in his death and resurrection. I love the illustration that the Old Testament is like a dark room and we're kind of fumbling around this dark room and feeling for the furniture and we can kind of feel a, a sofa over here or what feels like a sofa at least and maybe a table over here but we're not sure it could be a chair and we're tripping over things and then suddenly the light of the new testament is turned on and we can see clearly we can see it all makes sense the bible is a bit like that the Bible is like a complex mystery story. You can't understand the end until you've understand the beginning, understood the beginning. And you can't understand the beginning until you've understood the end. You need both. It's a coherent story. This is an extraordinary claim by Jesus, though. He's claiming that the whole of the Old Testament is about him. I mean, that's outrageous, isn't it? D does this mean that every sentence in my Bible, or the first half of my Bible, I just need to sort of uh, decode the letters and sort of jumble them up and suddenly, you know, the word Jesus is going to jump out of me? No, I'd suggest not. What I think it means is that all the people and the patterns and the promises of the Old Testament are, find their fulfilment in the person of Jesus, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Old Testament shows us what God is like. It shows us his character and his plans and how they are fulfilled or culminate in the coming of the Son of God and the spread of the gospel to all nations. Now, at this point, I, I like to imagine what 
Jesus would have been speaking to those two travellers on the road about. Now, we've got a, a lot of material that he could be talking about, but, and he only had like an hour or two. Um, it's not that far to Emmaus. But I wonder whether maybe he spoke about Abraham. I wonder whether he explained to these two followers that he was the ultimate descendant of Abraham, who through whom God would bless the nations. I wonder whether he spoke about the Passover lamb in Exodus, how when the, when the Jews were leaving it, um, uh, Egypt, they had to, to slaughter a lamb, sacrifice a lamb, and spread its blood over their door frames so that, so that death would pass over their house and the firstborn would not die. Maybe he explained to them that he was the true Passover lamb. Maybe he explained about the whole, how whole, the whole sacrificial system laid out in Leviticus and other books it was pointing towards people's need for a sacrifice to cover their sins so that they could be forgiven. Blood had to be shed. Or maybe he explained to them that, like the priests in the Old Testament, he was the true priest, the priest that they were pointing to, that we need someone to go into God's presence on our behalf. Maybe he explained that he is the true tabernacle, the true temple, the place where God can meet with his people. Maybe he explained how all of Israel's kings, even the greatest king of Israel, David, were just mere shadows of the king of kings. They were pointing towards this promised king. Maybe he talked about the, the prediction of the virgin birth in Isaiah. Maybe he talked about the suffering servant that Isaiah talks about, the man of sorrows, pierced, crushed, that with his wounds we are healed. And there's so much more that he might have been speaking about. When Jesus says in John chapter 5 that the scriptures bear witness to me, he really means it, doesn't he? All of the people, the patterns and the promises of the Old Testament have found their fulfilment in Jesus' death and resurrection. The Old Testament gives us assurance. It gives us certainty. It gives us confidence that Jesus is who he claims to be. What an incentive, hey, to, to read it, to study it, to know it. But I, I hear you. It's, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's hard to understand. It's difficult to read. And sometimes it's really dry. Believe me, I've just been reading through Leviticus. Ooh, that, that book gets pretty dry at points, you know? But it's worth it. Read it. Watch it, even. I mean, there's so many dramatised versions now as well. Listen to it. I mean, think about it. A large proportion of the Bible uh, was, was intended by the authors to be read out loud. If you struggle with reading, just get it on audio. Find trustworthy teachers who can teach you and explain clearly what it means. So Jesus here in this passage made sure that the understanding of these two travellers, their understanding of the resurrection, was first grounded on scripture before it was grounded in experience. Before seeing him in the flesh and recognising him in the flesh, first they had to see him in the Old Testament. Perhaps this is the reason that he wouldn't allow them to recognise him at first. He wanted to show them himself, but at a much deeper level. Jesus shows himself to us through the Bible. Take a look at verse 30 then. Finally, they recognise him. As he picks up the bread, they've sat down for a meal, he picks up the bread, he blesses it, thanks God for this bread, and breaks it. And it's at that moment, suddenly, it all comes flooding back, doesn't it? Perhaps this simple action of breaking the bread 
suddenly reminds them of all the times that they've sat with Jesus over the last three years and eaten bread with him, eaten a meal with him, and he's broken the bread and blessed it. Perhaps it's reminded them of the feeding of the 5,000. Perhaps it's reminded them even of the, the last meal that they ate with him before he died. Maybe as he broke the bread, they saw the nail marks in his hands. Suddenly their eyes are opened and they recognize him. It all makes sense. All the pieces of the jigsaw fit together and they can see the whole picture finally. But they don't just recognize him physically, do they? Because Jesus has opened the scriptures to them in verse 32, he opened to us the scriptures, they say. Now they can recognize who he really is. They can see why he had to die the way he did. And they can have certainty that he is truly alive. Their hope is now grounded on more than just what their eyes can see. It is now based on both experience and the promises made in the Jewish scriptures over hundreds of years which have found their fulfillment in Jesus. And how do they respond? Check out verse 32. They say this, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? They have a deep emotional response. This is not just indigestion. (laughs) This is, you know, their hearts are set on fire. This is what happens when God opens our eyes and we can read or listen to the Bible knowing that it's not just a dusty textbook of morals or rules to live by. But instead we realise that it is an epic, interwoven tapestry of books, of poetry, of history, of narrative, of all the different types of literature, knitted together and pointing us towards who God is and how he seeks and saves the lost. And we can only read the Bible like that if God opens our eyes. For Cleopas and his friend, Jesus had opened the shutters of their mind. The light of the Old Testament had poured in and had revealed who he really was and what he had come to do. Let's ask God to open the shutters of our minds, revealing the great love of God and the lengths that he would go to save sinners like you and me. Ask him to set your heart alight as you realise who Jesus really is. So in closing then, when we are downcast, confused, doubting, God wants to reveal himself to us. Jesus wants us to have confidence that his suffering, death and resurrection were no accident. They were the fulfilment of all the people and the promises and the patterns throughout the whole of the Old Testament. Jesus shows himself to us through the Bible, through the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is no ordinary book. It is an epic love story showing us God's great love and the lengths that he would go to save you and me. And if you want a practical application, well, it's simple, isn't it? If you want to know God, get to know this book and ask God God to open the shutters of your minds so that you can see Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this passage. Thank you that we can meet together virtually um, and study your word together. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for giving us confidence that your son, Jesus, is who he says he is. That his death and suffering and resurrection were no accident. Thank you for grounding our confidence 
in more than just what our eyes can see. Open our minds to the Bible, Lord, so that we can know you better. Amen.